Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake and today we're going to look at some more writing questions in our writing. So let's see what we can answer today. I don't have, like there are so many book recommendations, I'm not even going to bother with this one, what nonfiction books to read to improve creative writing. There are so many. Everybody is always going to say On Writing by what Stephen King as one of them. There's just so many books if you want to improve your writing. <laughs> How to let a reader know two characters care about each other. With this, I don't necessarily mean romantic relationships. I mean relationships in general. For example, you start a story off with a brother who's looking for his sister. What's the best way to let the reader know that the brother genuinely cares about his sister? Are flashbacks good for this, or is there another way? Um, the fact that he's looking for his sister, unless he does something that's dubious or makes it look like he's kind of a scumbag, and the reason that he's looking for her is for a scumbaggy reason, uh, I think the reader is going to assume that the brother cares about the sister because he's looking. You don't need more than that. Action kind of expresses how you feel about somebody, kind of expresses relationships between people, and it would say that he does not care if he did not go looking for his missing sister. But since he is looking for his missing sister, and we don't have context like, well, he has to look for his missing sister or his parents are going to kill him, or he's looking for his missing sister because he has, you know, set up a sale of his sister for human trafficking purposes, like, unless we have a scummy reason, if he's looking for his sister, we're going to assume it's because he cares, straight up. No more is needed beyond that. I've been pondering this. I have a very casual idea to write a YA novel about the Titanic with real people as the main characters. I have a particular interest in Edith Rosenbaum slash Russell. I think a very a single I think I think a single career woman traveling alone in the first class with her two full staterooms, one for her and one for just her clothes, such a fabulous notion. I read The Miniaturist a long while back, and ever since, I've been interested in writing a fictional novel about nonfiction characters and events. I'm not sure about the legal issues that might arise. My main question is just how distasteful it would be to write such a thing at this point. After all, Edith only passed away in 1975. Even if I were to pick a different person, is it distasteful? Is it taste? Even if I were to pick a different person, is it at all tasteful to fictionalize the lives of people I have no familiar connection with? See, so I would go ahead and say generally, especially if you're calling it fiction, um, go for it. I don't think that I would ever consider it distasteful to write a fictionalized version of a story about a real person because it's happened forever. I mean, even Pocahontas is a fictionalized version of a story of a real person. There are so many stories, like alt, alt history stories are just this idea. You know, alt history stories with Hitler, alt history stories with different kings and queens and you know, different individuals throughout history, and it happens all the time. And of course, but of course, I would say that I don't feel like this is distasteful because I'm writing a story that is heavily inspired, and it's not using Jeffrey is not my main character, but I'm currently writing a story that fictionalizes different aspects of Jeffrey Dahmer's life and makes him the main character. So of course, I'm going to say I don't think it's distasteful. I've also started writing a little series. Now this is closer to it. I've also started writing a little series of plays, uh, like 10 minute plays, with starring different serial killers and just kind of snapshot moments of their life. Um, and so I'm obviously fictionalizing real people. Uh, some people would call it distasteful or uh, what's the word that I want? Ex exploitive to use um, pe such high profile people, but you're telling a story, you're calling a fiction. I say go for it. <laughs> but also be prepared that certain people, especially if they have a connection to whoever you're starring, might have a reaction to it. And you just have to say whether you care or not. Uh, personally, and I'm not a lawyer, but so you can ask a lawyer, I don't think that there is any legal issue with it as long as you call it fiction. But especially when you're talking about the Titanic, how many different Titanic movies have there already been? You're not going to have much of an issue with this. I mean, really, any movie based on true events has some fictitious events, like The Irishman and Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Good, good one right there. I have no idea how to describe a person being ugly. I have seen ugly people like everybody else, but when it comes to, dis to giving a description of what this person looks like, I can't. I can describe beautiful people and even average-looking pe people, but not ugly. I can just say he was ugly. 
but I don't know how to say what is ugly. When it comes to giving a reason why somebody is considered ugly, it's usually something like a long nose, weight, acne, but it usually sounds like, is this it? If this wasn't for, if, if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for that, this person would be attractive. Considering I have a character who is very emphasized that she was ugly when she was a child, I'd like to get better at it. Um, so you pick... One of the things that really helps with this is you pick metaphors. Metaphors, descriptive words, descriptive pictures that are not attractive. It doesn't have to be acne. It doesn't have to be a long nose. You can get really, really creative. Like, her face looked like she'd been run over by a four-wheeler three times. You know, <laughs> you know, she had the face of a pig. She had a face of a rat. You can use anything that would be a less than than generous way to describe somebody and you can get really creative. It looked like she had acid. You know, she was born with a face melted by acid. She didn't have eyebrows. You know, whatever. You can just get super creative and make it just, if you were to imagine what would be repulsive that is not a specific oh, she had a crooked nose. Oh, she had, you know, little thin lips. If you could make it kind of a weird description that makes you kind of go oh, oh, oh. You could even her eyes reminded you of a face of a cockroach, you know? And something like that that just makes you go, what the frick? That's really how you do it. You, As with any case of describing something, I like to follow Jonathan Mayberry's to, um, suggestions in general for this, which is you pick three aspects of the character which really stand out. And one would be something specific, one would be something you can imagine, and the third is something that's kind of off. So what he used as a an example is the little girl was wearing a pink fairy dress and had a bandage on her knee. So you know exactly a pink dress. Fairy dress is something that you kind of imagine, and then the bandage on her knee kind of doesn't mesh with the appearance of the outfit. And that's just a really simplified version of it. So one thing that's specific, one thing the audience can imagine, and then one thing that's kind of off. And that will help give a very clear picture of the, who this character is just based on their appearance. You know, so if she had like ratty hair, ratty knotted hair, and just a, a beehive on her head. What is it? What's something that you can imagine? A face that looks like it was splashed with acid or, you know, treaded on by a four wheeler 20 times. <laughs> and then, I don't know, what's something that wouldn't work with that? It's a weird smell. Make her smell like something weird. And it gives you, a, a like, a drawback. But that also gets away from the acne. If the acne is an important thing, if acne scars is an important thing, you know, that could be something that you pick at. But just, to, just think of things that kind of put a repulsive image in your mind. How do you feel about cliches? I'm a big believer that nothing should poke the reader in the eye, nothing should be jarring, nothing should take you out of the flow of words, especially where names are concerned. Well, now I've got a problem. I have a character whose name, whose name's either Tyrell or Terrell. I've gone back and forth between these without setting on which, settling on which. It was going to be the latter, but I feel like the obvious nicknames for those names would be respectively Ty and Tex. And outside of the period Western, Tex feels weird. It feels like a cliche Western black hat name, and it seems a little po eye pokey. Well, you know, cliches aren't bad. Let's let's first let's define to the two different cliches. One is the cliched phrases like "deer in the headlights." You know, stone cold sober, perfect storm, and those should be put in a separate group altogether, which are words that another author has already strung together. And so you don't want to use those in your story because then it's basically like somebody else has written your book. And often, and I've had to go through this with my own work, and I still go through it when I'm editing, is when you use cliched phrases, it loses your authorial voice and your character voice because technically you're using somebody else's words. 
So I would avoid cliched phrases. Now, cliched characters, cliched stuff like this character being named Tex in a Western, it works if you make the system work. If you make it work in the system, and I have had so many instances where I'm like watching a movie or playing a video game or reading a book, and it's just like a, a one for one of this of this sort of text thing, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's so straightforward and it's so obvious, but it's hilarious or it's so fitting, and it can work if you commit to it. Now, cliches aren't the same as trope necessarily, so we're going to leave the trope conversation to the side. I've already talked about tropes before. Um, and you can find that conversation in the catalog here on my channel. But cliches, not necessarily bad. Sometimes, and a lot of the time, if you just lean into the cliche, like text in a Western, it really, really works out just fine. <laughs> How can I genuinely write a light romance? I've never fell in love in my whole life, and I really don't know how to write a slow, light romance between these two characters. Does anyone have any tips or suggestions? Um... <laughs> I mean, this right here is really read, study, and just write, practice. You, you know, it doesn't even just have to be reading. You can watch movies, you can read books, you can play video games where romance is part of it, and just see what other people do and then express it. I have never fallen in love, and I have written plenty of characters with chemistry who fall in love, who have great relationships, interesting relationships, interesting dynamics. I've also never killed anybody, but I've written books about people killing each other. So, like this, most people who write books haven't lived through the events. Stephen King was never attacked by a killer clown, and Tolkien was never from a fantasy world. So, true stuff. You know, you just, you, especially for stuff like light romance, you just read and research and observe and try to apply and practice applying what you see. And sometimes you're going to fail, and sometimes you're not going to fail. But you just do it. You don't have to experience something. We're not method actors. I know some writers try to live what they write, but you don't have to. Don't go killing people so that you can write a thriller novel. I say this now before you read any of my books that have kill people killing people in them. I am innocent. Believe me. Is it all right for the main character to be introduced? Let's say the 12th page in the 12th page for a way to show the antagonist and his overall ambition. I'm not entirely sure what this means other than if it's introducing the antagonist first. And if it's doing that, then it kind of harkens back to what we're running into with Mer Meritropolis, the series that the book that I'm reading and the series of the uh, just critique right now. And um if it's just to, to kind of say why the bad guy is doing what the bad guy is doing, I would avoid that because you're just loading up the reader with exposition and not getting the action ready. With that said, your, your main character doesn't have to be introduced all the way at the beginning of a novel, but you should be fairly careful about... A lot of, a lot of um, writing guys will say, try to introduce your main character as soon as possible. A lot of time, readers will assume the first name dropped in your book is the name of the main character unless they're given reason otherwise to believe that it's not the main character. But I would avoid front-loading your novel with exposition or reasoning for why the bad guy does what the bad guy does because you want to get straight into the action. You want to draw the reader in with movie, with momentum. And... Um, by just having the antagonist monologue or kind of reflect on why they do what they do, you're not going to make the re you're not going to pull the reader in. We need to care about the character and see the action before we're like, why the frick are they doing this? Describing and explaining story help. Hello, I'm looking at writing as a hobby and would like to know if you have any tips to get better at explaining and describing what is happening in a book. I have the idea and the imagery playing out in my mind like a movie, but it is difficult getting that out onto paper. For example, I'd like to say five men are fighting around a campfire, but I'd like to describe it better than that, but I'm not sure how. I want to say the campfire flickers as the moon reflects against the river and the sound of the sword clanging, etc. I know my pro first problem is that I don't read enough, and maybe just reading a lot more will help it solve the problem. Yes. <laughs> if you're not sure how to do something in writing, and I don't know why so many authors avoid this, but if you're not sure how to do something in writing, go and try to find other people who are also doing it. Um, that's how I came across the Rust Maidens. I don't, well, I wasn't necessarily looking to it for answers, but I was writing a story that kind of merged 
um, a, like nightmarish landscape or kind of surrealistic landscape or, you know, and, and meshed that with the real world. So I wanted to see what other people were doing to melt some kind of supernatural or weird world with the with the real world that we know. And so I was seeing what other people were doing when I was struggling to figure out how I wanted to start my novel. Some of my novels are one of my earlier novels. I was picking up other novels that are kind of similar in genre to see how they started them. Like when I was working on Dead in Drive, I picked up Agatha Christie's and then there were none because it's very similar in that it has the large ensemble cast at the beginning. And I wanted to see how she introduced each character and specifically which character was introduced first and how that first character introduced played with the rest of the story. Um, with my current novel, Cain and Abel, once I finish the first draft, I'm going to pick up other books that I think are going to be beneficial in style for it, like Fight Club, and I have Less Than Zero over on my shelf by Brett Easton Ellis, and I'm going to look at how those are stylized and see about adding that kind of stylization to the narration, because that's the kind of feeling and vibe that I want to the narrative style, which I know it does not have right now. And so if you're ever not sure about how to do something, you should be looking for other resources, other authors, especially established authors or people that you admire and see how they handled something. And that will give you the best idea of what, how to do it. So in this case, if you're trying to figure out how to best describe an action scene with like five or six people fighting, you're gonna wanna look at other people, at novels with other people that did like ensemble fighting casts and maybe look for some that are in the same kind of time period and then maybe look for some that are outside the same kind of time period so you've got the, those fighting with the sword and maybe those not fighting with the sword and it doesn't have to be five people in a forest you don't have to look for a one for one but if you have like a couple of cops arresting somebody or you know that would be i feel like that would be a fairly good one <laughs> but i'm i'm always going to talk about Carrie and Comfort by Dan Simmons. There were some great ensemble scenes in there and fighting scenes with so many different moving pieces. But the writing in that is just spectacular in general. And the weaving, I will always recommend that for anybody to read and kind of get ideas for how you want to want to work a long saga, like a long, not a saga, a long story with a bunch of perspectives and a bunch of characters. Read it. It's so good. <laughs> but... Look for what other people are doing. Write stuff down. Don't expect your first version of it to be the best version that it's ever going to be because it's likely not. And it will usually get better the first couple of times you edit it and then at some point you end up over editing it. Just, just don't worry. Uh, another way after you've read it is imagine the perspective that the scene is happening through. Whose character's perspective are we being described this story from? And who are they telling? Because every story, every narration, even if it's third person, close, or third person, omniscient, technically they're telling the story to someone. So imagine who is talking and who they're talking to and what that person is seeing. If it's omniscient, then you can obviously see everything. If it's close third, then you're going to be seeing the world through that one person's eyes and explain stuff of how they would see it in their point of view and what they would see because they're not necessarily going to see that guy in that bush over there like the Omni would. And so those are the uh, the two tips, but especially read and look for stuff that is being written the same that you are trying to write or similar to what you are trying to write to get tips on how to do it. That's why I often read and maybe a lot of people don't like this, but I read with a highlighter and I highlight you know passages that I like that I think, oh, that's written really interesting. Oh, that's a character description. And I know I struggle with character descriptions and I like this character description. So I know where to come back to when I'm looking for how to do a character description oh the beginning of this chapter is really really good at setting the new perspective and i just look for those areas where if i'm struggling what am i looking for oh that's written really well highlight it so i can come back to it later if i need it i don't know why people are obsessed with this introducing the main character through the eyes of an antagonist for a story i'm planning I thought about having the prologue first chapter be told from someone who gets into a conflict with the protagonist. I figured it would be a neat way of showing bits and pieces of a protagonist's characteristics slash personality and then next chapter where it's then from the perspective or the protagonist's POV, readers can get a better understanding as to who this person is. Not sure how common or unique this idea is. I don't know any authors who do this, but if anyone does feel free to tell me a lot of people do this and I feel like especially 
I'm like I hate to say, it, newbie authors especially like to switch perspectives in order to have a character tell stuff about another character. I've read it so often, especially in beta readings or proof readings for other people where the perspective suddenly switches to somebody else so that that somebody else can describe the main character. And it is actually, for me, often really cheap. It can be done really well, don't get me wrong. But a lot of the time, the random switch just to tell who the character is is really cheap and kind of lazy because they don't know how to tell, how to show who a character is better than through the eyes of somebody else. And I would also be wary of this kind of thing, of telling the protagonist through the antagonist's point of view, because the antagonist is not going to share the same vision of the protagonist as the writer is going to share. So an antagonist would see the protagonist as bad, because that protagonist is stopping the antagonist from what they want. And so the, pro the antagonist's point of view on that main character is not necessarily going to be positive. And it's not necessarily going to reflect exactly what you want from the protagonist's point of view, if that makes any sense. So the protagonist might actually be a great person, but the, from the protagonist's point of view, or the antagonist's point of view, they're going to be like, this guy is stopping me from doing what I want, and they're a terrible person because I'm in the right, or, you know, they're stopping me from getting what I want. And and so if you if you expressed who the protagonist is from the antagonist's point of view, it's usually going to be a lot more negative because the antagonist has no reason to like that character. Um, so I would avoid this specifically if it's just to express who the antagonist or the protagonist is because what we should be getting from an antagonist's point of view is their point of view in general, not their point of view on the, on the protagonist to show who the protagonist is, if that makes any sense because it's not going to work. The only thing that switching perspectives is good for is to express a new point of view from that specific character. I don't know if that makes any sense. Again, Dan Simmons, Carrie and Comfort, you get the antagonists, you get the protagonists, you've got one perspective that's in first person, all the other that are in three, third person, and you just get the world through their point of view. They don't necessarily, like, the, the first person is through a, a bad guy character, but she has no idea. She's just a crazy old woman to think she's in the right. It's, it's so good. But you're not going to get a clear vision of anybody that she's interacting with through her perspective because she's insane. <laughs> so keep that in mind. If you're in the, the, the antagonist point of view, you're stuck with whatever their insanity level is, whatever their perspective is, and it's not necessarily going to be what you want people to know about the other character. Otherwise, you'd break personality. But that is my perspective. I'm a little harsher with changing perspectives because it's not always the best idea. And it often happens mid-chapter with new writers. It can happen mid-sentence with new writers. Um, it can happen mid-sentence with established writers. But that's my but. You know, there's that. Let me know what you think about this or any of the other questions in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your perspective. I'd love to know how you deal or think about some of these things. And I will see you next time. See you later. And don't die. I need you. I need to see you next time I see you. Okay? So don't die. <laughs>